Good evening, everybody. I'm Tessa Blackstone, and I chair the board of the British Library, and I'm really delighted to welcome you all here this evening. Um, we are going, in eight years' time, to be celebrating the 50th anniversary of becoming the National Library uh, of the United Kingdom. And Reddy Keating, our chief exec, thought that it would be appropriate to celebrate that in advance, in a sense, by thinking through what our new vision ought to be in the years leading up to our 50th anniversary. So Living Knowledge um, is the name of the publication, and it's going to set out our ambitions for, for growth and for development uh, over the next eight years and indeed beyond that. Um, it defines our role, and it makes a case for a really vital uh, and growing importance not just of this institution, but of the knowledge economy generally, um, including uh, other institutions that are involved in the knowledge business, including other kinds of libraries. Uh, everybody in this room knows very well that over the next decade, we're going to see an enormous amount of change in information services, uh, in research, in culture. And I think it's our job to be able to respond to all of those changes effectively. So we hope that we will be able to go on being a truly creative and innovative institution. Uh, and I'm very confident that we will um, in, 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 manage to do just that. We also want to be working in partnership with many other organizations, including some of you who are represented in this room this evening. Uh, Rowley is going to talk for about 45 minutes, and then I'm delighted that Peter Barron uh, from Google, um, who will be our near neighbors in the Knowledge Quarter um, in the not too far distant future, is going to chair a, a question and answer session. Um, I hope at the end of all of that, as many of you as possible will be able to stay for uh, another drink um, and a few more canopies. So, I'm now going to hand over to Rowley. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Tessa. Uh, thanks to uh, everyone for coming. Uh, thank you to those of you who are allegedly uh, looking at this on a live stream on the internet. Uh, nice to see you all out there. Uh, and thank you too to Peter uh, Barron. Um, uh, Peter and I uh, have a bit of history uh, because the last time we worked together, I was controller of BBC Two, uh, and Peter was a very distinguished editor of Newsnight, a very challenging editor of Newsnight. Uh, since then, we have both moved in different ways into what Tessa just described, I suppose, as the knowledge business, uh, sometimes seen as opposite poles of it, and that's one of the themes uh, I want to explore tonight. We are, of course, launching this, which I hope you've all found uh, on your chairs, uh, but I am shamelessly going to use it as an excuse uh, to have an opportunity two, two and a bit years in to having taken on uh, in succession to uh, the great Lynn Brindley, uh, the role at the head of this great institution, uh, to reflect on what it is that I've learned uh, and felt and discovered about the importance not just of this institution, but the whole network uh, that it represents. And my theme is the library in an age of data and algorithms, those algorithms that drive Peter's business. And I have to say, people do ask me perhaps more frequently than I might have expected. In the age of Google, of great search engines, of information on screens, uh, does the whole idea of the library still even make sense? It's a serious question at a time of constrained public funding. And what we collectively believe libraries are for and what they are will determine in what form they survive and I hope thrive in the years ahead. And that's across the public, the academic, the research sector, and indeed the national library sector. So let's, let's bring that little bit uh, of opposition to life, uh, the debate that we have. Uh, Tessa mentioned that Google and we are indeed partners. We are. We are both part of what we've called the Knowledge Quarter of London, this extraordinary region uh, around us. Uh, that's us, just to the left 
uh, of St Pancras Railway Station. And in a few years' time, uh, Google will have their headquarters roughly there. Uh, and if you want to bring to life the choice people allegedly have, they could stand in front of St Pancras Station and turn left or turn right for different ways of accessing culture, knowledge, memory in the digital age. If they turn left, I guess they have an idea in their heads that looks something like this. Uh, and if they turn right, they'll get that. <laughs> and it feels a profound difference, and it's a difference that all of us who work in this business have to worry about, a set of values that have encoded the idea of the library for decades or centuries uh, on the left, intention perhaps with the new values that we live with all the time uh, as we live our digital lives, our mobile lives, our social media lives, that sense of tension, push and pull or contradiction. And of course, I'm here tonight to say I do not regard there to be any, believe there to be any such contradiction. The role of the library is proudly to do all of those things, and it's our capacity to bring those dimensions together, however difficult it is, that gives the idea of the library such durability. And that really underpins uh, the philosophy uh, of the vision that we are publishing today. And amid all the complexity and all the debate uh, and analysis around the precise uh, role of institutions like these, we first of all have tried to keep things simple. As you look through the book, there will be some statements of mission, first of all, that we are here to make our intellectual heritage accessible to everyone for research, inspiration, and enjoyment. A few words in that sentence, but the word everyone is probably the most powerful and demanding, and I will come back to that. We are a great publicly funded institution, and over time, yes, in the age of connectivity and digital, that's our mission. And we structure what we do around six statements of purpose. Uh, custodianship, growing, building, looking after that great national collection, I'll tell you more about that. Research, putting it to work, uh, making it available for anyone who wants to do research of any kind uh, on any topic. Business, it's there in our founding act, support for industry, finding ways to actively stimulate new ideas, the innovation that leads uh, to economic growth. Culture, engaging everyone with memorable cultural experiences, exhibitions like the wonderful Terror and Wonder exhibition uh, on at the moment. Learning and education, something I think we're going to be stressing even more, but we will not build the researchers and innovators of tomorrow unless we now expose them to the extraordinary treasures that we have here. And finally, our international role. Every national library has an international dimension by definition, this one perhaps more than others, uh, and we will work constantly to advance knowledge around the world and enhance, increase mutual understanding, another theme I especially want to come back to tonight. So this institution, uh, I don't think I understood it when I came, and I've had to learn and explore this. Uh, and it's a young institution. I think that was the first thing that really struck me. People hear about national libraries and they feel a sense of history, and of course that's true. But it is in fact one of the great visionary post-war inventions. Arts Council, Radio 3, National Theatre, there's a, a small but very distinguished list. And it was a courageous vision of a new kind of institution in the service of research and innovation. And it did indeed bring together, uh, at its heart, underpinning it, the heritage collections, those enlightenment roots of the British Museum Library and the British Museum uh, uh, archive collections, document, document collections. Uh, but it also conjoined it with a commitment to serve science and technology and research in the here and now. It was born out of that classic white heat of technology, I guess, of the 60s, and went live in 1973. I often say we are, in a way, a child of the digital age, born with only a few years, actually, of, of uh, Microsoft uh, and Apple, and on site here, in fact, since 1998, when, uh, when Google was founded. And that building there was, in the age before the web, 
as close as you could get to it in terms of research infrastructure. That is Boston Spa in Yorkshire, the bit of the British Library Londoners don't really know about. But designed to be at the service through what we now call the document supply business of the library, to make content accessible to every research library, every public library, the length and breadth of the land. And in the days before connectivity and wires, lorries would go in and out every day. They still do. It's where the National Collection comes in. There it is, the library at the heart of the system. Not what Londoners just think it is, not just that great heritage collection, but a working vision of how you put knowledge to work. And again, we feel it was born using the tools of its time. This is a visionary idea whose real potential is only just coming into being now that we have the tools uh, of modern technology at our disposal. Underneath it all, though, always, first and foremost, is the collection, this extraordinary national collection. Uh, there's a picture taken in Boston Spa, uh, I might say. Uh, it's a very, very poor quality picture, uh, but I'm very proud of it because it was on my, taken on my Blackberry and I tweeted it, and it's about the only successful tweet I've ever made. Uh, the caption I gave to it with 140 characters was historic newspapers as far and as high as the eye can see. And yes, indeed, this is inside uh, the brand new, not yet formally opened, National Newspaper Building there in Yorkshire. Uh, it is a great project with a great commitment of public money to save and preserve the National Newspaper Collection. Uh, uh, some 33 kilometers, 750 million pages, pages dating back to the late 17th uh, century, and it's growing all the time. If you go to Yorkshire, you see the lorries arrive every day. It's like hay bales with newspapers and magazines still coming in every day, now protected and preserved uh, and uh, robotically controlled to be discoverable and retrievable. And every month across the whole of the National Collection, some eight kilometers of new physical content comes in, some 6.8 terabytes of digital no one really seems to be able to tell me, I have to say, how big this collection is. When I first came, I was told it was 150 million items. Uh, the other week, somebody told me it was 200 million items. So who knows? What we do know is that it has something like 14 million books. Then there are journals, newspapers, magazines, manuscripts, archives, sound and music, video, maps, patents, prints, stamps, photographs underpinned by a mix of the great founding collections. I'm looking at some of our founders, uh, even as I speak, those busts behind you there, Robert Bruce Cotton, Robert Harley, Hans Sloan. But uh, accumulated over the years, others, other magnificent private collections, and of course, the magic of legal deposit, uh, copyright deposit by which every publication uh, comes into the library uh, every day. Uh, and. The result of that is treasures beyond compare in the John Ripblatt Gallery behind you, top left there, I'm sure you'll recognize, is the earliest dated printed book, the Diamond Sutra uh, from 868, the Tang Dynasty, uh, and so on beyond that, the Lindisfarne Gospels, Shakespeare. There is ephemera and there are treasures. There are items in it uh, which are both ephemera and treasures. This is John Lennon's uh, handwritten uh, lyrics to In My Life, which, as you can see, was originally going to be about Penny Lane until Paul McCartney uh, ripped off the idea. There are new kinds of archival collection coming in all the time which push our boundaries. Here's Wendy Cope's personal collection, one of the biggest literary collections we've had. 15 storage boxes, we kind of know what to do with those. 40,000 emails and Word documents, and we've had to really keep pace to know what it means to collect and preserve material like that. We need to develop new skills uh, to capture the operating systems that are already becoming defunct in front of our eyes. And of course, I mentioned publication and legal deposit, but the great journey of the library over the last 10 years has been to envisage what that meant and keep pace with it. 10 years ago, the library began by permission collecting websites and making them available. The UK Open Web Archive, this is freely available to everyone, and it takes a snapshot and it preserves websites exactly 
as they were when they were published, when there was a little bit of a controversy uh, a year and a half ago about a political party which had allegedly removed an old speech from their website which maybe didn't quite conform uh, with current policy, researchers were able to find it on the UK Web Archive in its original form. A little vision of how important it is not just to collect but to preserve and to continue to make available. And of course, uh, in 2013, that went ballistic uh, when officially, finally, copyright deposit was applied to the entire digital domain, every e-book, every e-journal, uh, and indeed every website within the UK domain uh, is now collected here, truly beginning to develop the idea of the library as the national memory in a way that future generations uh, will recognize. That journey from the Diamond Sutra to last night's website, I suppose represents the extraordinary journey that the library has been on up to this point, and many of those themes will continue. But as we were putting living knowledge together, we have identified a number of major new challenges, many of which will require all our resourcefulness, all the support of our friends in fundraising, uh, in making the case, in bringing partnerships together. Uh, and I will touch on that theme as we go through. Uh, briefly, a few of them. If the last decade was about rescuing and saving the national newspaper collection, and we did, uh, it was suffering, it was failing, the Collindale building, roof was leaking and so on. We believe the next big challenge, and some of you may have heard this on the radio today uh, already, is the audio heritage of the UK. The National Sound Archive is based here, an extraordinary collection of some six and a half million recordings, growing all the time, I might say, by voluntary deposit from the music industry and by the extraordinary work of oral historians and other sound collectors. It's on 40 or so different formats, and some of those formats will be illegible now, we reckon, within about 15 years. The technology is simply fading and dying in front of our eyes. This is an instance where digitization means preservation. It's an expensive, difficult business. They'll have to be triaged. We won't be able to protect everything. But nonetheless, we are building a partnership, not just of us, but of regional archives around the country uh, to campaign on this, to raise public awareness, to fundraise, so that the amazing work that our teams do here can actually be amplified to the benefit of the UK uh, as a whole. Music, sound, voice, region, uh, and so on. Other big themes. The network of partnerships around the UK, uh, the public libraries uh, that we work with already, uh, there are six of them uh, around the business and IP centre began here. I'm delighted to say uh, next week, uh, we will be, or in the two, next two weeks, we will be launching partnership business centres in both uh, Liverpool and Sheffield to complement the ones already there uh, in Birmingham, Ma uh, Manchester, Leeds and Newcastle. We set out a vision here. We believe that should be at least 20 libraries by the end of the decade. And by a hub-and-spoke model, we want the influence of that to radiate out even to the wider public library network. And I'm sure we'll be talking more about that. What else? We want to build on the growing success of the public program, exhibitions, events. Uh, the library, by the way, didn't do any of these, really, 15 years ago. Now, the kinds of exhibitions we do here, the talks, the happenings, the engagement with the cultural life of the country is second nature to the kind of institution that we are. We want that to be heard and felt increasingly outside London with partners. Talking of outside London, Yorkshire. Boston Spa, uh, originally, and I hope forever, the home of document supply uh, and the commitment to support research, but you saw that newspaper building. Uh, that itself was a successor to a high-tech storage and collection management facility we built previously. We believe the geography of Yorkshire, uh, that original inspiration of having a national library centre facility right at the centre, the geographical centre of the UK, its time has come again as increasingly historic print collections uh, in city centers are less used but need protection and need to be made accessible. We are developing plans for a long-term vision for Boston Spa, which we hope will come to fruition 
over this next strategic period to become a shared facility to work with other partners across the cultural sector, university sector, uh, and other kinds of organizations as well. Uh, uh, other themes, self-help and reliance. And I'm not going to talk about this at great, uh, in great length, and this isn't going to be the entire solution, but this, if you like, is a symbol of how institutions like ours will increasingly need to find every piece of resourcefulness to raise the funds to support what we do. We will fight determinedly for our public funding, but we will also build the new models that help us get there. Uh, and I only mention this because I finished reading this book last night. It was, as you may know, the number one bestseller several weeks running in Waterstones. It's part of the British Library crime classic series. It's been a huge commercial success. Uh, and I think copies are available in the shop uh, afterwards. It's by Eleanor Fargen's long-forgotten brother, J. Jefferson Fargen. Bless him, he wrote 60 books, so I think we're on to something here. Uh, and it was a truly uh, delightful read. But perhaps more seriously, um, if we are looking at one or two of the themes in here that will come to dominate uh, the activities of the institution over the next period, uh, I think it may not be Mr. Fargen, uh, but this near contemporary of his, uh, whose legacy really will be with us. Uh, this, of course, is uh, Alan Turing. And uh, interestingly, uh, at almost exactly the same time as J. Jefferson Fargen was writing a Mystery in White, Alan Turing was writing a paper called On Computable Numbers. This was 1936. And as I'm sure some of you in the room know, that was the paper which first set out then hypothetical devices that were capable of any computation if it were representable through an algorithm. And the insight in that paper, there's a piece of intellectual heritage for you, is the route from which Peter's company and indeed almost all innovation that we now live with uh, derives. And I mentioned Turing uh, for two reasons, uh, partly because of that insight uh, and because I think even since we wrote our last vision, the power of data has become even more significant than ever, but also because it was announced in December, one month ago, that the institute named in Alan Turing's honor, the Alan Turing Institute, uh, a publicly backed institution dedicated to innovation in data science, uh, will be based here at St Pancras uh, at the British Library. Oh, there's his, by the way, his fictional, semi-fictional incarnation, of course. Uh, uh, this is why the world now knows about uh, Alan Turing. Uh, but the, uh, uh, the British Library, in partnership with the universities who form the consortium to run the Alan Turing Institute, will have at its heart, over this next period, the period of living knowledge, a new institution dedicated to the great revolution of our time, which is the revolution in the creation, analysis, and exploitation of data in all its forms. And it's our job, uh, I think, to ensure that that really does mean data in all its forms. We know the extraordinary insights that will come uh, for medical science. We have colleagues from the Crick here next door, the Crick doing extraordinary work, uh, bringing, bringing big data to bear on innovations there. Uh, we've seen it in the social sciences, but also in an organization like this, a, a, a building like this, dedicated to knowledge in the round, we believe it's vital that you use that innovation and insight uh, to analyze, find new patterns in, new innovations in the national collection itself. I've talked about the born digital collections, the data set of the UK web uh, itself, uh, and the library uh, already has a role in making data sets more retrievable through the data science system. Uh, but increasingly, finding different questions to answer by looking at them as data uh, rather than just, uh, uh, just text in their own right. Here's a little snapshot, and as you have a drink afterwards, you'll see the real thing, by the way, if you want to see a little bit of raw data. Uh, this is a very, very brief snapshot from a data set uh, uh, derived from the automated Book automatic book retrieval system of the British Library. These are actual books being ordered, retrieved, delivered in our reading rooms. I think this is about two minutes worth. Uh, and you'll see the video afterwards, uh, at, which is both 
simultaneously the visually dullest and most beautiful video I've ever seen because it, it's hypnotic and compelling and it reveals moment by moment the secret unconscious thought process of what really goes on here, the sheer diversity of human inquiry uh, that is made possible by great knowledge institutions. And it's ensuring that the age of data is pump primed with the full richness of human knowledge uh, that animates us uh, as we go on this next journey of the library's uh, existence. So that increasingly, as not just our brand new digital collections, but our historic collections become digital, you can do more things with them. There's Lewis Carroll's manuscript uh, of Alice already there uh, in digital form. Um, but increasingly, we will need to build on the extraordinary global partnership we are already putting together uh, of funding sources to unlock a global resource of knowledge in digital form, which can then be put to use for those creative manipulations uh, that I was talking about. Just to give a, a sense of the range, because when I put this together, I was astonished to see just how many ventures we are doing. Every single one of them, I might say, fundraised for. Uh, we don't put public money into this. Uh, this is something where we, in common with our sister institutions, simply have to be uh, resourceful. The Tata Foundation uh, in India, helping to support a project to digitally reunify the glorious 17th century Mewar edition of the Ramayana. Two thirds of it here, uh, the remaining thirds scattered across different institutions uh, in India. Uh, launched earlier last year with an exhibition in Mumbai, but available free now online. A thing truly of beauty. Gulf history and Arabic science, working with the Qatar Foundation, a team upstairs here, digitizing some half a million items, both about the history of the Gulf and the Islamic transmission of Western science. Here's a 12th century edition of Archimedes on water clocks. Malay manuscripts, uh, William and Judy Bollinger generously working with us and the National Library of Singapore to digitize our collection uh, of those exquisite artifacts. Uh, Hebrew, this wonderful book of Esther is part of a project funded by the Polonsky Foundation and now gloriously working with National Library of Israel to make it even bigger so that ultimately one might be able to digitally reunify the entire corpus of Hebrew manuscripts, not just our collections, by the way, but the other great collections around the world so that they all enter this realm. Uh, uh, Greek manuscripts, the Stavros, Stavros Niarchos Foundation. Uh, this is a very, very beautiful gospel book from Constantinople from the 10th century, an image of St. Luke. Uh, and uh, the Iran Heritage Foundation, working with us on our Persian manuscripts and so on. A little tour of the memory and culture of the world. All artifacts pretty much under our feet here, but locked away locked away perhaps for those privileged few whose orders might come up on that data set I showed you earlier, but gradually, piece by piece, scanner by scanner, finding their way into the global public domain to be discoverable, used and enjoyed. And since we're talking about folk having big visions back in 1936, there's one of them. Uh, uh, again, it was clearly a very it was, a, it was a prolific time, I think, for thinking back then, uh, and much of this was prefigured. This was a set of essays that Wells wrote at the time, imagining, and he didn't know what Alan Turing was writing, but nonetheless, something was in the air, foreseeing a time when we could actually begin to piece together uh, 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 something on a global basis that replicated the kind of cultural institutions you'd seen hitherto just within a single nation. Uh, and by the way, Wells connected that very, very directly to conflict and world peace. Uh, he saw that as building bridges between nations. So as those ideas really come to life, uh, I think it's been particularly moving for us in the last year to see one such, if you like, global encyclopedia, uh, Europeana, a, a coming together of different uh, uh, libraries, archives, and museums across continental Europe, uh, coming together to commemorate uh, the conflict of 1914-18, uh, suddenly what maybe seemed like a rather abstract project took on something deeply moving, formally 
uh, combatant nations working together to celebrate terrible events that happened a century earlier. Uh, not just uh, archival materials, by the way, from the official records, uh, but also uh, family items. We had a great roadshow in Boston Spa, but we're also contributing very directly to this project. Uh, this is from the India office records, for instance. Wonderful image uh, um, from Brighton Pavilion, Brighton Pavilion Hospital. Uh, and these are some Indian, wounded Indian soldiers. Uh, and they're enjoying a gramophone concert. Uh, and at the same time, a Scotch piper, Scotch piper discoursing on the bagpipes adds zest to the party. Uh, that, that bizarre little glimpse of cross cultural life in the fringes of World War I is now not part of just of European heritage, uh, but world heritage. And what's intriguing is that what's happening here uh, is an idea that's taking root in other continents, uh, in Trove, National Library of Australia, building their own uh, model to bring together state library collections. Uh, in America, the Digital Public Library of America, still young, just a couple of years old, but growing fast and connecting uh, not just museums and libraries, uh, library contents, but even private collections. Uh, Google themselves intervening very interestingly and excitingly here with their cultural institute uh, that provides a platform for cultural institutions to offer curated exhibitions in this space and so on. That Wellsian vision, uh, underpinned now by data, by algorithms, by digitization, is quietly but very, very importantly becoming a reality. And of course, the vital thing is not just to publish or make accessible, it's what you do with the content once it's in that form. And that's the truly fascinating journey that we have been on uh, and through living knowledge intend to go even further. Uh, to give a few examples, this is our, uh, one of our historic maps from our, one of our, did I mention we had six and a half million maps? Anyway, we have one of our six and a half million maps, uh, another collection that grows all the time. But of course, these historic maps are in analog form. Uh, and if you digitize them, that's all very well. But they only really come to life if you can link them to real contemporary geographical data. And that's a project called GeoReferencer uh, that we work on with Cloaken Technologies. And periodically now, it's become like a little global festival. We release a batch of newly digitized maps onto the web and invite people anywhere on the planet to tie them in, geo-reference them uh, to Google Maps so that you can you know, do the manipulations, spot the locations, bring them together. And once you've done that, then all sorts of other things become possible. You can begin to apply uh, 3D imagery. Uh, you can begin to look at the contours uh, and so on. And that thinking, uh, what one thing leading to another, is what's so appealing, I think, about the world coming to life around us here. Uh, that's inspired something different called Off the Map, which we're now, I hope, going to be able to do every year, working with Game City in Nottingham, where we release some content, partly from our maps collection, partly from our images collection, and invite a competition for students working in the computer games business uh, uh, or sector to come up with virtual environments uh, based on them. Uh, this year, of course, in honor of terror and wonder behind you, the theme was Gothic, uh, this is Font Hill Abbey, of course, William Beckford's extraordinary creation. Uh, and if you're equipped with a nice pair of virtual reality goggles, a nice Oculus Rift device, and I have seen the chairman of the British Library wearing an Oculus Rift, you need to know, I'm afraid I don't have a picture of it, uh, then you will be able to enjoy the winning entry, uh, which was this, uh, by a team from the University of South Wales uh, calling themselves Gothulus Rift, which is a fantastic immersive 3D creation that could never have happened uh, without the stimulus of the collection. So we're getting more scientific about that. Courtesy of the Mellon Foundation, you'll be detecting a theme here, um, uh, we now have an annual uh, competition called BL Labs, where we invite people from anywhere in the world to unleash themselves on British Library digitized collections to see what can be done. Uh, and to give one um, one example, there we are, the, the title of the lecture. Um, some years ago, uh, we worked with Microsoft to digitize uh, a large batch of 19th century, 18th and 19th century books in the library. And many things have been done with that very important corpus. Uh, but perhaps the most intriguing was the team uh, who put this together. It was led by Ben O'Steen inside the library and the digital research team here. 
And they created a simple algorithm called the mechanical curator, which is a very simple-minded creature. This creature crawls through every single page of that corpus of digital, digitized historic books and stops when it gets to a picture or an image, anything that's not text, and it pulls out the image. And lo and behold, in almost no time at all, we found ourselves possessors of 1,064,000 fascinating images that had not been seen by human eye uh, for a century and a half. Uh, and, uh, well, different applications come from it. Uh, if you're feeling lonely on Twitter, you can follow the mechanical curator, uh, and he or she will send you one of these images randomly every hour. It's very pleasing, you know, compared with what a lot of other things you get on Twitter. Uh, but more boldly, uh, the digital research team decided, and I say decided, by the way, I may be chief executive, but I found out about it on the morning that we did it, uh, to publish uh, all 1,064,000 of these images uh, to Flickr Commons just before Christmas, uh, two Christmases ago. There they are, a sudden gift to the world, to the world, uh, from the vaults of the British Library and to unleash any creativity anyone on the planet felt like applying to it. And of course, one thing you'll see on the right there is it needs tagging. They need understanding. These images are obscure. They need information. What are they of? What do they connect to? What can you do with them? They're all, by the way, public domain. Uh, and then, intriguingly, uh, we then had a call from an American artist called David Normal saying he had an idea for a major installation at the Burning Man Festival in Arizona. Uh, and no permission required, but he was going to go ahead and do it. And sure enough, there was crossroads of curiosity. This is all within six months of publication. Those historic images have become this extraordinary image right at the heart of a great festival, which will be coming, I hope, to the piazza now of the British Library. We're going to try and bring it home uh, in some way. Who knows where this journey goes? But it's not just about creativity uh, and data. Part of the power of the tools that we now have uh, is about restoring, preserving, and sustaining cultures. Uh, and that's, in a way, the theme that I want to um, to, to, to move towards now. Uh, increasingly, what we are finding is that we, we have extraordinary privileges in this institution. As you can tell, we need to fundraise to do what we do, but nonetheless, uh, the collections are known. They are understood, uh, and they can be brought out there. But it's the forgotten cultures, it's the lost bits of global heritage, uh, the ones that are vulnerable, that are perhaps most important. And again, we touch on this uh, in Living Knowledge. Um, this year, I'm very pleased to say we are celebrating the 10th anniversary uh, of one of the most generous projects we do from the, uh, the um, Arcadia Foundation, the Elizabeth Rousing Foundation, called the Endangered Archives Programme. It, it's managed out of the British Library, uh, and it is about identifying archives anywhere in the world, not ours, but which can then be digitized usually digitized on the ground with the items themselves preserved in situ, but published via the British Library to the world uh, forever. And there's an element of training, of course, uh, consciousness raising, uh, but most vitally, preservation uh, and access. So far, 77 different countries, 224 different projects, some 3 million images. And for myself, stepping into the library, a project like this is simply extraordinary. The world needs to know it and understand it. Even just there, this, these are very recent, um, recent ones. Uh, photographs from Syria and Lebanon, manuscripts from Ethiopia, top right, and Romania, uh, bottom left. On the right, uh, pamphlets and other propaganda material from Mongolia just after the end of the Soviet era. In other words, recent archives that would not otherwise be preserved. Other tales, other tales from this realm of culture disappearing uh, before the age of data uh, and technology made it possible to uh, protect it. I mentioned the sound archive and the vital importance of saving those sounds. Uh, and yes, of course, they have an important regional uh, aspect, but things like this only come to fruition really 
into clarity um, when, uh, uh, when you actually talk about something specific. We were approached by Chris Kidd from the university, a social anthropologist from the University of Glasgow, and he was working with the Batwa people, uh, who some of you may know about, uh, in the Great Lakes in Africa and Uganda, who have been displaced in fact, as a consequence of, of conservation initiatives there, but they've lost their tribal homelands. And he wanted to find out where, literally, in the world, any record of their heritage might exist. And, of course, it turned out to exist here. We had field recordings uh, from the 1950s. And I might say, by the way, we still make field recordings. And he was able to find a recording of the almost forgotten Rutwa language. Uh, and this is a picture a few years ago. Uh, this is Jeremiah Bungajare uh, from the Batwa people, who has just heard, in fact, what turned out to be his father's voice recorded uh, for the first time. He apparently did a, did a dance after he, uh, he listened to it. But that personal connection uh, was quite extraordinary and is just a glimpse, I think, of where these um, collections can go. And collections are fragile. Uh, and just to give a sense, uh, uh, and I thought hard about whether I should include this, but I think it's, uh, it's important, and I, I want to pay tribute, actually, to our, my colleague Andy Stevens, who's not here tonight, but he's been our board secretary, but has also attended to our international relations over the years. Uh, this image, you may see the date down there, is uh, uh, 2003. This is the uh, Iraq National Library and Archives, uh, and that can show you how fragile collections and national collections can be. Uh, and we, through the offices of Andy and others, played a role in helping them reconstruct that collection uh, through digitization of artifacts that we hold here, particularly those India office collections. We had material uh, that relates to that, so surrogate copies, maps, photos, books. And indeed, over time, we worked with university libraries around the UK to actually help them restock with some physical items as well, social science journals, that again, bringing together heritage items uh, and uh, uh, contemporary research materials. A galvanizing effort through digital and physical means to help restore a collection. And uh, their national librarian, my opposite number, Dr. Saad Iskander, described that as he was talking about the role of a national library in those desperately difficult circumstances uh, as one of national identity, true citizenship, uh, and civil society. And I might say, by the way, Dr. Iskander's institution came under threat again only last year um, when the ISIS troops came close to Baghdad. So this, is a real, this can be a real and present danger. So as we talk about this extraordinary age of data that we are going into. Uh, I think it is vital there, by the way, is the uh, Iraq National Library back in business, to think about why we are moved by that image uh, and to reflect, as well as all this connectivity, on the vital power and importance of libraries as place, real physical places. This is part of uh, the very beautiful collection we have, uh, and some of them are at Reba, uh, of Colin St. John Wilson's drawings for the building we're sitting in, standing in uh, right now. Uh, a hard-won building, I might say, controversial, expensive, built only of the finest materials because Sandy Wilson couldn't bear the thought that a national library for the people should be built to any standard less than a great university or indeed a palace. And so it has proven uh, to be. But a thoughtful building, uh, a building full of symbolism and meaning and reflection. Uh, he thought deeply, and he, he had time, actually, with all the delays. He thought deeply about what such a building could be. Um, this extraordinary tower here uh, behind you there, there in the image uh, houses George III's book collection. It was on display in what's now the Enlightenment Gallery at the British Museum. It sits there in pride of place here in this building, a working stack still. Every day you will see the trolleys move in and out to retrieve items from it. Uh, but Sandy had imagery in mind here. He was thinking even of the Kaaba in Mecca, of a, of a large a black box that somehow attracts people to want to come around it. And sure enough, in this secular age, we are finding people want to work in the vicinity of that extraordinary place. 
It's full of little intellectual ideas, emotional, imaginative, spiritual ones. Uh, and for those of you digitally minded, it was built around the most perfect user experience that Sandy Wilson could possibly imagine. Maybe that's why the building externally took a while to take root, because it is built, engineered, conceived from the inside out to provide that perfect, uh, perfect environment. Uh, and what is fascinating in this digital age is that we are seeing more footfall, not less. It just appears to be, and I think this came out also in uh, uh, William Seacart's re recent report on public libraries and elsewhere, that the more, in some sense, our lives become screen-based, the more importance many of us place on the physical encounter, the human encounter, the allure and fascination of the precious physical object, and the space, and often the public space, where we can be both public and private together, private study in a public space. We have the privilege uh, of living that idea, I think, in one of the great truly one of the great post-war buildings, but we are only part of a whole network of such buildings and spaces, the length and breadth of the land of the UK and globally. Uh, libraries, in the age of the internet, you might say that libraries as a network predated the internet and indeed may yet outlast it. They are the most powerful and resilient network of all, a network of shared values and mission across languages, faith, uh, political boundaries. And I'm very, very struck that we are launching Living Knowledge at the start of what will be our great year where we celebrate Magna Carta. Uh, it's in conservation now. It'll be re-emerging very, very soon. And in this extraordinary year, the 800th anniversary of the granting of Magna Carta, um, we'll be thinking, of course, not just about power, and the rule of law, um, but also about rights and values uh, and our idea of a good society. And it seems to me that libraries and the infrastructure they represent are part of the infrastructure of a good society. And their values are values we need to be able to articulate ever more strongly, because that's the extraordinary thing about them, whether they're big, small, academic libraries, public libraries, your local community library, this place, I have been struck stepping into this world of the commonality of values and beliefs that holds it together. And I know it is an old set of values, which is why I think they will last. And everyone defines them slightly differently. Uh, but nonetheless, I would note that they include independence from politics, commerce, and religion though sensitive always to all three, a commitment to freedom of research, thought, creativity, and expression, a very, a very meaningful value, I might say, uh, in the week that we have just seen uh, here in Europe, a place of sanctuary and safety. I think people sometimes come here because they feel safe. And again, the architecture protecting the physical uh, is part of that. That is certainly true of small libraries in vulnerable uh, communities. And trust. Uh, trust in many ways, uh, but in the digital age, I might say, just to return to the theme of data, a trust now and forever uh, in a set of professional values that will ensure the authentication of data and information. Data, big data, small data, highly contestable. It can be manipulated, abused. The shape of data can be created for ideological reasons. And unless you understand that uh, and can treat it with all the clarity uh, and trust of libraries historically, you will miss it. So that retention and protection uh, of the, the knowledge infrastructure of the UK is what we argue for in the document we're publishing today. Yes, we will fundraise. Yes, we will partner. But at heart, at every level of government, and across, this is not just a culture ministry thing. This is about the whole connecting of forces across the UK. It requires sustained, patient investment. There's economic value there, but libraries help societies to be wise as well as productive, and wise societies nurture them. As we put it in living knowledge today, the UK's success depends upon the freest possible flow 
of ideas, inspiration, and information. And libraries, not just this one, uh, but the whole network, big and small, of public and academic libraries across the UK are the vital enabler of that. Thank you. Good. Thank you. So we, uh, Sarah. Thank you very much. Could you, could you get me my drink? Uh, thank you so much, Roly, for, for that. Uh, I'm, I'm Peter Barron from uh, Google. As uh, Roly said, we are former colleagues, and I'm going to be your host for a little bit of Q&A. And I think we're also going to try to take uh, one or two questions uh, from Twitter as well. So prepare your questions. Uh, you put your hand up, please, and a microphone will find you shortly. So, I mean, a very, very broad-ranging sweep there, uh, Roly. And I think I also detected a slight favouring of uh, John Lennon over Paul McCartney somewhere in there as well. Um, we have McCartney lyrics through there, but I think they're <laughs> fine, yeah. Um, but one thing I wanted to pick up, which you touched on at the end, which was, was there in the announcement today, which is around economic growth. And you actually said that, that economic growth is dependent on free flows of information. Can you say a little bit more about that, how you see the, the work of the British Library feeding directly into future economic growth? Well, we feed directly uh, and indirectly, but I think it, it came home to me, well, perhaps most vividly, actually, when I mentioned the Alan Turing Institute uh, coming here, and I was struck that the, the Chancellor himself wanted to make that announcement because I think he was seeing increasingly investments in knowledge as being investments in economic growth. We're still, by the way, a great manufacturing nation, a great physical nation, and again, that we, we must never seduce ourselves into thinking that we're somehow on a one-way journey from the physical to the virtual. But nonetheless, the power of creativity, imagination, originality, if you look at the intellectual heritage of this country, uh, has always been Britain's edge, uh, what has been so uh, uh, unique, wonderful, and that's across the sciences and literature uh, and all the arts. And increasingly, uh, we've seen recently the launch of the Creative Industries uh, Federation to try and notice that there's a whole sector of almost the industrial economy that we hadn't noticed because it was entirely based on ideas and creativity. And I think you and I know we both worked in, uh, uh, in different aspects of, uh, of, of um, content-related industries. You need the freest possible, as few barriers as possible uh, to uh, accessing information and in particular what libraries stand for, uh, even though they may be landlocked, you have, may be, have to go there to find them, but under these roofs you can find anything. And the, the task there is to make that as open as possible. We're seeing a revolution, which we talk about in the book, uh, in openness of all kinds, uh, one of which is the open access publishing revolution, where increasingly you are seeing as a point of policy uh, research that has been funded by public money uh, being published openly to the web. So we just find ourselves, I think, at an extraordinary historic juncture with the combination of the web and the historic traditions of institutions like this, where if we organize, our, organize ourselves correctly, then I think we are remarkably well positioned to go into a period of great creativity and growth. Okay. I have one, one just in from Twitter. Um, do you think the library ought to focus on being a top-class museum of books rather than trying to compete with Google? from Edward Small via Twitter? Well, we collaborate with Google, Peter. We don't compete with Google. Um, and, uh, uh, and in a way, your company has become a virtual institution uh, that, that partners well and generously. So that's not a competition. It is a complementing of it. And we complement it, I hope, in the talk. It will make clear in many, many different ways, including make, making use of those tools. Uh, and. Uh, it's interesting, when I came here, people were uh, uh, very wary about that word museum. And no, this is not a museum. Uh, but nonetheless, I don't decry museums either. Museums are, in a way, uh, discovering what is library-like about them, and libraries are to a degree discovering what's museum-like about us. You, if you walk into the collections next door, you will undoubtedly see extraordinary treasures, and yes, we want to celebrate them as, uh, and, and deliver extraordinary learning experiences and wonderful exhibitions as any museum would. But I hope you'll understand from the spirit uh, of what we're publishing today, the very title of it is about 
uh, making things new. Things are alive and changing and creative. And if you like, we're neither a search engine nor a museum. We're a library. Uh, in the most generous definition of what that great historic word means, uh, we're creating the conditions for people to make connections, to put things together intellectually or creatively that have never been put together before. That's a very distinctive role. We can work with museums, we can work with you, we can work with others. Great. Questions from the floor? Lady in the middle there, please. Microphone on, on its way. Hello, I'm Kira Eastall. I'm the president of the Society of Chief Librarians. Um, I think those of us that work in and with public libraries um, really recognise the values that you've set out, Roly, and strongly welcome the direction that you've asserted. Um, libraries of all types, uh, public libraries, do amazing things and have enormous potential for the future. Um, and it is a time, as you know, of huge change. You've been involved with the uh, Seacart Report, as you say. With the re publication of the Seacart Report just before Christmas and coming and your report, um, Living Knowledge, coming on hot on the heels, what two or three practical things do you think we could do over the next 12 to 18 months to really show what libraries of all types can do that respond to the, the, the recommendations of the independent report and help you deliver living knowledge? Well, in terms of um, practicalities uh, coming out of the William Seacart uh, report, a task force is about to be set up uh, and will be part of that. I think your organisation uh, will be. Uh, and that has a set of very, very practical endeavours, including looking at the digital space, uh, looking at growing skills across the sector. But I think, I hope it will be animated, and we talk about the next 18 months, with, if you like, a lowering of mutual guard between the different stakeholders here. My observation serving on William's uh, fascinating report, I see Jonah Trollope and, uh, and others involved with it here tonight, was that somehow everyone had imagined that someone else was somehow running the public library system. And it was a, a dawning realization that there is no such system. It is a set of the same obligation placed upon different local authorities, many of whom do brilliantly, but nonetheless they are struggling financially to keep the kind of levels of investment they might once have been able to put into it. So almost inevitably, the answer must be in finding better ways to work together across those boundaries. And I guess we have a very particular role sitting, I should show that very crude picture of Boston Spa, the British Library, symbolically at the heart of the UK. But I feel that and I feel a sense of responsibility. And although we have no statutory responsibility for the system, as it were, we are the British Library. Uh, nonetheless, I think it is right, and I think uh, we, we, I hope, will use living knowledge as permission to speak out more and to be more open to find new ways to work. And we have just today, I should say, uh, submitted a response to consultation to Birmingham City Council's uh, consultation on the very, very tough judgments they're having to make uh, in budget terms in Birmingham. But nonetheless, if you look at it as part of a national system, that extraordinary library in Birmingham has to be worth investing in and sustaining and protecting, both in itself and as a talisman, a bit like this place, uh, for what a library can be. What might that mean in practical terms with, with Birmingham? Well, there are, uh, uh, we already work with them. The, the Business and IP Centre is up and running, and you'll see the British Library brand there. Uh, I genuinely don't know whether there's a, anything bilateral, but certainly systemically some of the things we're looking at in um, uh, the Seacart review is, for instance, around uh, digital systems, uh, websites, uh, the digital products we all use. Are we really acting efficiently across 140 different library authorities, a national library, university library? <laughs> to both think of ourselves as independent, but also as part of a system. And I have to say, stepping into this industry, if you want to call it an industry, I have been struck by the library sector's potential to pull that off. Some of those national library partnerships we're talking about are exemplary uh, because we can contribute to a project led by the National Library of Israel, but it's still their project, but nonetheless the content comes to life. What I think we're opening the door now 
to doing is versions of that in the UK. So the proud localism of the library system here is protected, but the sensible, not just economies of scale, but joint working uh, that is best practice can also be brought in. But it's very, let's not underestimate how tough this is. Uh, we are in an organization here where for all the, the, the optimism and ambition that I've set out today, we are facing, in common with other cultural institutions, a persistently and consistently reducing core grant in aid. At the same time, all the local authorities who run all the libraries are themselves having to make probably even steeper cuts. So this, this requires resourcefulness of a very, very high degree because the absolute amount of money is going down. Yeah. Next question. Bill. Uh, Bill Thompson, uh, still at the BBC, having failed to escape like you were <laughs> uh, Peter. Um, I, I thought your, your, your lecture and indeed the, the document are incredibly inspirational and, and seem to mark the, the progression of the British Library to a, a deep understanding of it, it, its role as the gateway between the physical and the virtual. And that was incredibly well articulated, that, that you link these two together so the book remains important but virtual access remains, uh, becomes very significant. You've talked a lot about libraries, but I wonder whether there are also lessons for other cultural institutions. For example, the BBC itself as a repository of enormous cultural value for how it might liberate its archive and make its materials more available. You seem within the British Library to have achieved many of the goals that you set out within the BBC as controller of archive content. Is there stuff the BBC and other institutions could learn from what you're doing here? <laughs> Go on. Well, Bill, as you know, I've got a bit of form in there. Two, two very quick, quick reflections uh, on that. Uh, uh, don't underestimate the great work the BBC does already do, by the way, and the, and the genome project that you've got going finally is a fantastic, uh, fantastic piece of data publishing, may I say. But um, uh, uh, yes, with those partners I set out, the BL has, I think, is now doing really good work, but it is with public, uh, you know, historic content, public domain content, the, the historic material. Uh, the BBC is only 80 years old. Almost everything your organisation has is entwined with copyright in one way or another. Not just simple copyright, but complex collaborative copyright. So it is bound to be a long, tough journey for the. BBC to square the circle of simultaneously being a great memory institution, which it is, uh, and also being a dynamic uh, a, a broadcaster. But I do think we are at an interesting point where the BBC, as a cultural institution, and it's been great to see uh, Tony Hall really stressing that role there, can step forward and is stepping forward to become part of the solution and actually uh, it was Kira's question about uh, uh, the public libraries. Uh, I was delighted that uh, um, in the Seacart review, the BBC did step forward to say that it too would support the work of the task force there because uh, among the family of cultural institutions, uh, the BBC is one of the very, very few in the world that can invest at, if not at Google's scale, nonetheless at the scale of a large media organization in digital tools. And if some of those tools, products, resources, and sustained commitment can be put at the service of those digital economies of scale that might support the whole system, then the BBC really, really uh, will be making a profound difference, I think, uh, to the benefit of libraries, but also potentially museums and arts organizations and so on. Next question, sir. Oh, Simon, another ex-BBC here. <laughs> There is a connection, but I've also escaped. Uh, so I'm now a chief executive of a company called FutureLearn, uh, which is an uh, open university owned uh, provider of massive open online courses uh, with an alliance of 40 uh, UK and international universities. Uh, now, Rolly, you were, as the British Library, were also one of our first uh, founders, uh, partners. Uh, and I'm delighted that the British Library has forged a partnership with one of our universities, University of Nottingham, and will be delivering its first course, which is coming out of the Propaganda Exhibition mm. later in this year. Uh, and I think the potential to uh, unlock the uh, content uh, and the curators within uh, not only the British Library, but the whole uh, library uh, sector uh, is something we're just scratching the surface of. 
So why do you think uh, the British Library should be involved in the future of uh, online education? Uh, and what's your vision for it? Oh, it's quite a big question, Simon. But I think um, uh, the, the why, the why is, is deceptively simple. And I say deceptively simple because I ran through our statements of purpose uh, early on. Uh, and for those of you who are connoisseurs of such things, it is only really as of today that the British Library has publicly stated its commitment to learning and education in quite that, I hope, clear form. I believe very, very strongly uh, that we cannot be doing our job unless we use both the collections we have and the tools that are now available to, to express the learning potential and learning for all generations, by the way, this is not just about children or school children or students, this is all of us um, wanting to educate ourselves in different ways. So I think when, I can only say sometimes you run on instinct, but when um, uh, your, your um, outgoing Vice Chancellor Martin Bean proposed the idea of creating a, a British-based company to try and deliver these online courses, I just had an instinct that we had resources here that could be put in the service of such a venture. We don't know, what, by the way, where this goes exactly. Uh, uh, what you now call MOOCs will no doubt be called something else in a few years' time, but something is happening. Uh, and we are now finding new forms of storytelling. Uh, and yes, what I think is pleasing, maybe some other lessons from the past, if you like, the, the effort we put into curating a great exhibition, like in this instance, the propaganda exhibition, can now no longer come to an end when the exhibition ends, but we can, working with companies like yours, find ways to express its educational potential forever, or certainly give it, give it a very, very strong uh, afterlife. So that is uh, um, part of it. Uh, another part I didn't talk about in the, in the lecture, but um, we also this year launched uh, a, an online product called Discovering Literature, where we are uh, looking very, very hard at the needs of, in this instance, GCSE students and, and maybe undergrads studying English literature, because we'd seen research which said they found authors, historic authors, abstract and hard to understand and get to grips with. But we have the documentation here that can bring those figures to life. So Discovering Literature publishes primary sources for educational purposes. So it is, it's Jane Austen's handwriting. Uh, it's Charles Dickens' scribbles. Uh, it's um, next year, we hope, to, moving into the 20th century, Harold Pinter and others, uh, where you actually see the primary sources and the ephemera, uh, the newspapers, the magazines, the reviews, the photographs, the maps that bring literature to life. So, yes, watch this space, but a, but a big area. But another area, I have to say, where uh, we cannot ourselves invest at scale in the actual products. We will need joint ventures and partnerships to actually bring it to life. Now you made a very passionate case for the, for the physical space here, but perhaps we can talk a little bit about, about the future of both the space and also the physical books. Uh, is that something that is kind of guaranteed for the long term, both remaining here, but also continuing to collect the physical uh, items year after year? Um, let, me, let me quickly try and couple, uh, tackle a couple of those. I mean, I think uh, there will be, over time, uh, when it comes to literally the same piece of intellectual content, some switch out from uh, physical collecting to digital. Uh, I think you're seeing it happen uh, quite quickly in some areas of, say, academic journal publishing, where we are you know, already now beginning to uh, take in digital copies, not physical copies. I think when it becomes to more literary or unique items, I think the power of the physical remains pretty strong. Newspapers sit somewhere in between, uh, and uh, over time I could imagine a move to more digital collecting. But nonetheless, I think it would be odd if, say, the history of a, a print, great print product like The Times somehow stopped at a certain point. I think posterity will want to see an unbroken record of certain print items all the way through. The, uh, we should also assume, by the way, that uh, to some extent we, uh, we reflect the history of publishing, uh, and it's not absolutely clear to me that publishing as an industry is retreating from the physical book quite as quickly as we might have imagined. E-books are extremely popular, but are they plateauing? Perhaps they are. Something intriguing is happening. I can only say that British Library crime classics, uh, <laughs> while being uh, uh, exceptionally good value as e-books, are doing very, very well indeed, in fact, bucking the trend slightly as, as physical objects. So one way or another, we are contributing uh, to the stock of the physical there. When it comes to the spaces uh, and the building, this building was commissioned 
uh, to last 250 years. I see uh, no lack of likelihood in the basic fabric that it will do that. And I can only say socially, in terms of footfall and usage, we've seen 10% year-on-year increase just in the last, uh, uh, last year alone to our uh, the public programs and, and footfall around the building. Uh, every time we open up new spaces, they are heavily used. People want to be here, as I said uh, in the talk. And of course, as you know, this part of London, the Knowledge Quarter, everything that is happening here, um, we anticipate just organically the demand to have experiences in this space is set to grow, not shrink. So yes, one of the programs coming out of living knowledge, uh, we hope it won't be a call on public money, but it will be working um, with developers and architects and others, will be to find the next stage of evolution for this extraordinary campus here. Uh, the arrival of the Alan Turing Institute ultimately will, I hope, be part of an extension to this space, which will also deliver enhanced public realm that will begin to bridge the gap, for those of you who know the area, between us and the, um, the Francis Crick Institute, so that we truly go on that, that trend of, of openness I was talking about this, so it becomes not, uh, not so much a fortress and more like a, a, a campus, which I think is in sympathy with uh, Sandy Wilson's original vision of it, and I think we now have the capacity to, to think about doing it. Great. Thank you very much indeed. That was a, re a really inspiring and, and compelling vision of the, the future of the library. So thank you very much for that. Just to recap, the, the, the crime classics are available in the shop. Actually, um, it's closed now. It's, <laughs> we'll, we'll be available tomorrow, and um, uh, you and, and everybody else deserves a drink. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you very much.